Franz, thank you very much for being here. Um, uh, it's great to have you in the project um, and thanks for doing this interview. The question that I'd like to start with is when did you first become interested in intra or interlingual respeaking? I think I first became interested in or even aware of uh, intralingual respeaking when we met at a conference some years ago in Porto and you told me about uh, your work in, in London and your experience. And I think we had been in touch also about the topic of respeaking uh, in editing the, the Routledge Encyclopedia of Trend Interpreting Studies. But the truth is that as an interpreter, I've been socialized so much within the interpreting community, which is a, a very well-established, uh, highly professionalized community that doesn't tend to look too far beyond its natural borders. And those borders seem to be defined by orality. So anything that has to do with writing and subtitles and the media uh, isn't really, wasn't really on our radar. So uh, it really is only a very recent development and a very recent interest of mine that I'm all the more enthusiastic about these fundamental shifts and changes and new developments that in also include interpreting in a way. This is very interesting because intralingual respeaking was taken up by audiovisual translation rather by interpreting, uh, even though the process of intralingual respeaking is almost some sort of intralingual simultaneous well, translation, if you like. Um, but it was definitely taken up by the audiovisual translation industry and research community. Now, things do change with interlingual respeaking. So where can you position that? I mean, is this going to be, I mean, I guess it's hard to predict, but is this going to be just one more side to audiovisual translation? Or should we consider this as another form of interpreting? I think if we stay within very traditional um, assumptions, once you go interlingual and do this in real time, then we would have uh, immediate consensus among that, uh, the, the members of that professional community that yes, this is of course interpreting because that's what we do. We transform uh, or re-express a message from one language in another language in real time. That's also the, the well-established definition that we rely on uh, for defining interpreting as opposed to translation. The scholar by the name of Otto Kade in the 1960s uh, focused on not whether it was oral or written, which is interesting, but said it has to do with the process. And if, the, if it's a process done in real time, then it's interpreting. So by that definition, which after all goes back to the 1960s, how could this re-speaking not be interpreting? It is real time, it is re-expression in real time, and it is even interlingual. Now, once we've arrived at interlingual re-speaking, we're sure that this is kind of a form of interpreting, simultaneous interpreting. And if one, now we can take a step back and consider why then do we not take an interest in intralingual respeaking as well? Because after all, it's done in real time, it's re-expressing a message, uh, 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 making it fit for a certain user group. So yes, I think this has led to uh, an expansion of the concept of interpreting. The, the advent of interlingual respeaking first and then actually linking it up with even intralingual live subtitling. Um, and we realized that we have much more common ground than we used to think uh, five to ten years ago. So if there is that rethinking about intralingual respeaking and there is this new thinking about interlingual respeaking and about the common and shared um, areas, what do you think those common areas are? What, what common skills? What, do these disciplines have in common, these areas? Well, those professional tasks, uh, mm -hmm. simultaneous interpreting and um, re-speaking interlingually, or as some of us prefer to call it, uh, because it is after all a translational task, trans-speaking. Because re-speaking as a term, to me at least, seems to imply a more language-based uh, re-expression process and not so much a semantic reshaping of meaning, 
a grasping of meaning and re-expression of meaning. And uh, also within our ILSA project, I think uh, some of us feel very strongly that uh, the term re-speaking doesn't really do justice to the complexity of this new translational task that we therefore call uh, trans-speaking as a new form, as a variant form of uh, mm -hmm. simultaneous interpreting. And uh, the common ground is obvious. Uh, we designed a little task of process model for that yes. purpose together with Aline Remal mm -hmm. from Antwerp University, uh, which means the comprehension in the source language, uh, re-expression, uh, production in the target language, all these are major component operations of simultaneous interpreting, and they apply equally also to the task of trans-speaking. So we're basically doing the same thing, but there are interesting differences, actually things that make the trans-speaking task more difficult, more challenging than straightforward simultaneous interpreting. Uh, what, what I slightly dislike about the, the, the difference is that um, interpreters like using their voice. They realize that their par the paraverbal features of their voice, the delivery, the prosodic devices that they can use, is really uh, their strong suit. They, they can really come across, do things with their voice. And as a trans speaker, you're not speaking directly to your audience Absolutely. anymore. You speak to the software, to the speech recognition software. So that part gets lost. In that sense, the task is in, in a way impoverished. Mm -hmm. But in another sense, of course, new demands like uh, dictating punctuation, being very clear about the mm -hmm. correct punctuation and being uh, understandable, intelligible for the software speaking, enunciating clearly, that's additional qualities, really, that the trans speaker needs to develop in order to function well in this new mode. But there's definitely, in terms of the process, uh, that could also be explained in terms of Daniel Gilles famous effort models of, of memory and comprehension and production, very basic process model. In terms of that process model, you find uh, a lot of common ground, if not almost identity, of the main subcomponents of simultaneous interpreting and interlingual re-speaking or trans-speaking. That's interesting because there's also the added uh, difficulty or complexity of having to deal with your output. Uh, as a trans-speaker, when you have your output in front of you, you may have to correct some errors or not. And this interaction as well is something that perhaps is not that common or applicable to interpreting, right? So you have the screen with your errors and you may have to decide whether to correct them or not. This is an added complexity that we have to train these interlingual re-speakers or trans-speakers to do as well. Absolutely. This additional written output component that I haven't even mentioned, uh, uh, I was mainly focusing on the, on the trans-speaking part as yeah. such, you know, converting from the source language message to some form of spoken output for the speech recognition system. But if you go beyond that and, and add to the trans-speaking task, um, which is only part of the whole uh, live titling process, the, the, the monitoring of the of the output of the speech recognition software, the editing, possibly even including a keyboard use for editing, then it's obvious that the task becomes something unnaturally difficult that any simultaneous interpreter would need to shy away from because we never, as a simultaneous interpreters, we never have to deal with our output in written form and real-time editing before it gets presented to the users. So mm -hmm. it's definitely much more difficult than simultaneous interpreting if you see the live titling process as a whole, which means trans-speaking, interacting with the speech recognition software and uh, dealing with your written output, possibly even uh, editing, correcting it. And despite this complexity, we still believe that it could be feasible, at least in some contexts. Uh, and we're trying to train people to design materials, to be able to train people to do this. Um, what kind of profile are we looking for interpreters who could be provided with the extra training related to subtitling and subtitles for the deaf? Or are we looking at subtitlers who could be provided with uh, the skills to be able to interpret life? What profiles are we 
looking for? I think, and my thinking is largely based on some evidence that has been collected by um, researchers, including yourself, um, and in the in the ILSA project, is that there are several routes uh, for, toward this professional profile. Obviously, uh, I think I'm, I'm quite convinced that uh, having skills in simultaneous interpreting is an ideal route because the core process of trans speaking is largely has largely been mastered. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the basic knowledge about the user community, the deaf and hard of hearing, let us say, if that is that community, it's not uh, interlingual. Uh, Live subtitling is not limited to that community, but um, it's an important consideration. So that can be acquired. That knowledge of of uh, the uses and the quality required can be acquired. Can be, uh, I think, more easily acquired than the processing skill of simultaneous interpreting, and also the rules governing the production of subtitles. That is prepared subtitling, not under such time pressure. That is also something that I think an interpreter could uh, learn over time. Whereas um, the acquisition of simultaneous interpreting skills, which is an amazing multitasking, cognitive uh, attention sharing task, uh, requires time. And we have some evidence that it cannot be done in a few weekend courses, that you need to apply yourself over months, maybe half a year at least, maybe a year, practicing this special attention management skill. And therefore, I think it's, it makes sense to grab people with that kind of training who have already invested uh, several months, maybe, in the course of a, an MA training program for conference interpreters who already have that very unique specialized skill and add the subtitling knowledge and skills um, to that. Uh, I think the opposite route is also possible because there are if there are people who know about creating subtitles, uh, they can engage in training for simultaneous interpreting and they can acquire that skill as well. It would be interesting to have a comparative study. I don't think it would be feasible, but uh, which route gets you to the, mm -hmm. the target, uh, the finish line faster? My bet would be on training interpreters to become live subtitlers, but I, I wouldn't exclude, I wouldn't rule out the other mm -hmm. pathway. Uh, um, Franz, one of the beauties of uh, trans-speaking or interlingual titling, if you like, is that it can be um, of it can be beneficial uh, for both deaf people and basically hearing people who need access to uh, live content in a different language. So it brings together those two populations uh, with the same need for access. So in a way, we're talking about access for all there. But um, is there any issue with them having different expectations? Say, for example, deaf people are used to intralingual live subtitles with their errors, with their delay, uh, with their uh, particular uh, features. But um, the, say, for example, hearing people who may be attending a conference that is uh, interlingually subtitled live, um, they may be used to simultaneous interpreting. Therefore, they may not be used to first having to access text as opposed to audio not used to delay, not used to certain software recognition errors. Can you see any clash, any issues with that? Well, I think you've, you've presented the, the issue very clearly. Uh, there's just not a lot of experience out there. No user community with a set of norms and expectations. So there's a big question mark. We, we don't know what would be deemed preferable, acceptable, because the service as such isn't hasn't been widely offered and we're only now training the first generation of, of people who can perform this uh, task, which might be able to successfully compete with uh, simultaneous interpreting at conferences or it might not because we, we, we really don't know. On the other hand, these norms and expectations are very flexible. Yeah. Probably people in the 1930s and 40s didn't know what could be expected of a simultaneous interpreter at Nuremberg, for instance, yeah. they thought this is impossible to begin with and it's uh, it's only parroting, no, no meaningful messages could be produced and there were many, uh, as we know, many experienced consecutive interpreters, even in the United Nations uh, services, who were dead set against this new mode of simultaneous oh, nice. interpreting because they were fully convinced that it was impossible to, to make it meaningful and understandable. 
So now I think we're in a similar situation. Some of us might think it, it might not work as well because the, the errors in the written output and all, so on and so forth. But these these practices are so new that we should better give it a try and Absolutely. see whether we can be as successful <laughs> in the language service industry as the simultaneous interpreters were starting in the in the mid 20th century. Um, and on that, uh, what kind of research do you think is needed at the moment for for this for this new practice um, for interlingual life and dialect for trans speaking? What kind of research do you think would be the priority? Well, one thing I could think of, and it came up in connection with a project, ILSA project meeting that we had in February 2019, is whether it would be preferable in international events to have simultaneous interpreting plus intralingual subtitling, uh, uh, or to go for direct interlingual live subtitling at an international event. Uh, issues with time lag, with, uh, well, skills available. Uh, and uh, that's a research that's work in progress. We're trying to analyze the data that we collected in both modes at that event. And similar research comparing uh, these two modes, for instance, relay or direct interlingual respeaking uh, with certain events or audience groups might be only one example of, of research. Uh, expectation surveys at this point are still very difficult because if you ask people, what do you expect of an interlingual life subtitling service, they wouldn't know what to say. They have never experienced it. Okay. Which incidentally, unfortunately, is also a problem in much interpreting research nowadays because you do not find many real users of simultaneous interpreting uh, anymore in many settings where English is the lingua franca of communication and business and in scientific meetings. Uh, uh, if you try to ask people about their experience with simultaneous interpreting, you find that fewer and fewer people use that service, which right. could again be an opportunity for this new service. Maybe they don't like putting on headphones, but maybe they would not take their eyes off the screen if they are presented with an interlingual live titling service at a meeting, Absolutely. which is also what happens in films, that even though we might not want to use or read the subtitles, but um, it's almost impossible not to right. yeah. monitor the subtitles when we watch a movie. Absolutely. And as a final question, um, where do you see, is the usual question, but in this case perhaps even more pertinent, where do you see the role of technology taking us here? And I'm thinking... Um, the the automatic nature of some of the subtitles. I mean, with intralingual re-speaking, uh, one of the kind of developments that is more um, likely to happen is to have fully automated subtitles for intralingual uh, events so that you don't need intralingual re-speakers. Um, punctuation is an issue, etc. Do you think this is something that could happen as well with interlingual re-speaking or not? I mean, a combination of both. Where do you see that? Well, unfortunately, I would have to say clearly that I, I'm, I'm convinced that this is also what's going to happen for interlingual uh, life titling. Yes, uh, So, but it's less a technological issue, I find, but a socioeconomic issue or a social, po sociopolitical issue because these options are available. They have a price tag. And we like with interpreting, with quality conference interpreting, which will not go away, which was here to stay for certain applications, for certain usually elite groups, for meetings that can afford to bring in highly qualified simultaneous interpreters. So that service will be used if somebody is willing and well placed enough to pay for that service. And the same with these uh, meetings. So there might be some meetings where the groups involved are not powerful enough, do not have enough social status, and so the organizers might think that um, error-riddled uh, automatic subtitles are good enough, they cannot complain, so we'll give them this, and there will be other groups demanding or having the power, social power and status to demand high-quality high quality service, and they will get it, and they can get it with human interlingual life titling. But so there will be a split, a fragmentation of the service and of the market, I think, governed by uh, political and economic uh, considerations. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So exciting times ahead for researchers. 
um, to look into this. Thank you very much, Franz, for being here and for your enthusiasm. Uh, you know, um, working on on this on this area. It's fantastic. Thank you yeah. for having me as part of the project. Thank no you. No problem. Too.